Hey guys, we are Team Nerd and this is our presentation for RCJ. So essentially, in this presentation, we will talk about all that we did in um, RCJ and all the steps we took. So my name is Andy. My name is Druva. My name is Peter. And my name is Trujan. So first, we're going to be talking about hardware. We'll talk about the materials, the Raspberry Pi, MegaPi, and serial communication. So the materials for our robot. In last year's RCJ competition, we built our robot using Legos and the EV3. And this, this robot was less sturdy, but it was a bit easier to build. For this year's competition, we used the OSEP tank kit. And this is a metal tank kit that comes with treads and motors. This was a lot sturdier and was a lot, also a lot more robust than last year's. And that's why we chose it. So why did we choose to use the Raspberry Pi and the Mega Pi? We chose to use the Raspberry Pi because it is compatible with the Mega Pi and is a powerful enough single board computer that it can use its own camera. This camera is the main source of line following. Now, uh, the Mega Pi, which is an Arduino, is also compatible with the Raspberry Pi. It is able to control many different types of motors and can also have many sensors attached to it, which is great for our situation in RCJ. So what sensors did we use? On the Raspberry Pi, we used the Pi Cam, which is the main controller for our line following. And on the Mega Pi, we used the ultrasonic sensor, which is used for detecting distance, and the IMU, which is used for making more accurate turns. Moving on to serial communication. So what is serial communication? It's a way of talking between the Mega Pi and the Raspberry Pi. This happens when Serial, this happens when packets of bytes are sent through serial pins between the boards. And we send information such as sensor values, motor values, and other communication signals. So here's an example of serial communication. You can see that we are sending motor values. And on the left side, it's what the Raspberry Pi is sending. And on the right side, the, those are the values that are being received by the Arduino, uh, the Mega Pi. Now onto motor control. Since the Raspberry Pi is the main controller for line following, it has to control the motors using the Mega Pi. It does this by sending the motor values through serial communication to the Mega Pi, which then will run the motors. This allows the Raspberry Pi to indirectly control the motors, which is, exact, which is exactly what we need. So here is a video of our robot. And as you can see, we have the main motors for running the robot, as well as these servo motors, which are used for our rotating camera. It's currently just a frame, but the camera is in there on the actual robot. And these are just some of the uses of the Megapi, which allows us to control multiple motors at once. So the next phase is line flying, which I will discuss. So this phase was one of the most important as it took up a majority of the board, as you can see here, almost over half of it. And it covered several cases, including intersections, gaps, turns, curves, lines, and much, much more. It was made especially even more important for this year's 2020 RCJ competition, as after entering the evac room, you also had to exit and complete even more line falling. So along with this, we had a new challenge this year, which involved using the camera instead of the lighter and color sensors as we had previously used. This is both a challenge and brought many positives at the same time. So it was a positive as um, the lighter and color sensors had to be placed at a fixed distance and um, at a certain um, angle. So it had to be pointing down to the ground. The camera on the other hand can be placed at a much more flexibility. So you had much more flexibility with controlling the camera and it gave a wider field of view. Um, although it was um, easier to place, it was a little bit harder to use as we had much more to process and we had a greater field of view, so it could be confusing at times. But overall, it was a greater positive than negative. So this year, for software, we went from using Robot C to Python, especially using the OpenCV and NumPy libraries. So OpenCV was useful for frame and video control, 
And what a frame is, it's a single image while a video is multiple frames. So an analogy to this is one of those old timey movies. So old timey movies made up of multiple frames, as you can see here, which then are combined to make a movie. This is similar to OpenCV, which uses multiple frames to make a video. And we use their functions for editing and processing different frames and videos. The NumPy library, on the other hand, so a NumPy array actually makes up the OpenCV frames. So it's useful for manipulation and helped OpenCV do many of its functions. So the first step to line following was to understand the problem. And to do this, we had to plan for all cases in order to succeed and prepare for everything. To do this, we split line following into these categories. Line um, curves, turns, gaps, um, and intersections. And so um, another thing we had later in the future was we, when we had a line following processor, we would take pictures of all these different cases and then place them into the line following processor. So this allowed us to actually see what happened or how the robot reacted to each case. So the next step after understanding the problem was to brainstorm and develop solutions. So one of the most important um, aspects of actual line following was to find the line. Otherwise, you couldn't do line following or any other processes. To do, to do this, we, use, we utilize the computer vision function find contours. And this essentially highlights the line and allows us to gain information from it. However, it needs one parameter, which is a black and white image. To do this, we, use an, it, we had two options. We could either use an in-range or we could blur grayscale and threshold. So what an in-range does, it essentially places a mask over um, the black color and ignores all others. So essentially, as you can see, the black line is highlighted while all other, all other colors remain black. So as you can see here, this is the process actually occurring. Blurring and grayscaling and thresholding worked a bit differently. So blurring and grayscaling was used to reduce noise. So blurring worked by taking points of a frame and combining them to reduce noise. And grayscaling changed the points of RGB value into an intensity from white to black. So essentially made the whole image gray. And this all reduced noise. By the way, to clarify a bit more, noise is any um, incorrect values. In our case, it could be shadows or glare, which affected what the camera saw. And then also finally thresholding, what it did is it um, basically looked at every point and it said, if it's above this value, it's white. And if it's below this value, it's black. In the end, we ended up using the in range. As you can see, there's a lot of noise in the blurring and grayscaling, especially on the sides with all the static. And while the in range was mainly um, okay. And also the bottom image is showing the fine contrast function. As you can see, the coins are highlighted, which allows us to gain information from them. So afterwards, we proceeded into line following. So our first idea was to use the line of best fit, which involves seeing if the points in a frame had contours or not. After that, we used that information and plugged it into an algorithm to find the direction and position of the line of best fit. So to give an example, let's say the points are right here. Well, the line of best fit would go straight through them. On the other hand, we had cases like this. The line of best fit would try to go through as many points as possible. In the end, this ended up being too slow as we had to go through all the points of a frame. So it ended up being inefficient for line falling. Our next idea was to split the line into several sections and use each center to determine our next movement, which essentially means we divided the line. So as you can see in the video above, um, it's a clear example of what we had in mind. This is our inspiration and it's a video we found on YouTube. So as you can see, the line is divided into several sections and each um, contour center is compared to the actual frame center, which gives um, values for line flying. So this would be great as it would give us a whole a view on the whole line and the ability to process the entirety of the frame. In the end though, it ended up being too difficult to implement as we were confused on section weighting and how to work it all together. Another factor to this is that RCJ line flying is actually much, much more complicated as it has sharp turns, gaps, intersections, and spikes, unlike in the video where you can see simply just curves and straight lines. This is meant to um, uh, give an example of the highly disastrous situations and the unpredictability of the real world. So although we did not use the previous idea, it served as inspiration for our final idea, which involves spraying the frame into three sections, two smaller outside portions and one larger middle portion. So we would use the bottom section for line falling and the other two sections for special cases, which were gaps and sharp turns.
So to further elaborate on the bottom section being used for line flowing, we use a PID line flowing processor. And to find the error, we use the width center and the contrast center and subtracted them to get the error. Then we plug them into our other um, processes. So integral is the sum of the errors over time. Derivative is change over time. And we all plug that into fix, which essentially changed our motor values. And finally, past error is equal to error. That just sets up derivative, which needs to look at the change over time. And as you can see here, this is an example of a line of a robot going on a straight line and just doing normal life line. The next I will talk about on um, the two special cases we have and how the two sections actually found these cases. So to first to actually find or to think, is it a sharp turn or a gap? We constantly were looking at this top section. If there was a line, we would do normal line falling. However, in the case that there wasn't a line, we would think there may be a sharp turn or gap. Um, afterwards, we proceed to look at the middle section and see the middle contour. So we would take the height and width of the middle contour. If the height was greater than two times the width, we assumed it was a gap case. And in this case, we would just drive forward until we saw the line again. However, if the width was greater than three times the height, we would assume a sharp turn case was coming. And so what we did for this is we first, we got the contour center. This will allow us to know if we were turning either left or right. So if we were turning left, the contour center would be here. And if we were turning right, the contour center would be here. So in each of these cases, the contour center is either tilted in the direction of the um, line, so we would know where we were going. Afterwards, we would go forward until we did not see the line and then turn until the um, line was in the middle of the frame. Then we would go backward to prepare for any following cases because in the RCJ rulebook, it says that either a gap or an obstacle can be five seen away from a sharp turn. So we had to have enough room to prepare. And this is an example of sharp turn and the gap case. And this is a homemade ramp we made over quarantine. So next I will be talking about green square. So what is green square? Well, at certain intersections, there can be green squares in one of the four corners and there can be multiple green squares at a time. What your robot has to do is take into consideration only the bottom two squares and based on those two squares, know where to go. So for example, if there's only one square on the bottom and over here it's on the right, then you would have to turn right. If it was on the left, you would have to turn left. And if it was a double square case, such as this one, you would have to turn around and go back. If there are any squares in the top, you must ignore them and continue going forward. So as we mentioned earlier, this year we had used a camera and just like line tracing, it had its own pros and cons. One of the main pros was the greater field of view that having a camera provided. This allowed our camera to navigate green squares after sharp turns or any complex cases. But this also came with, with, with some cons, such as squares being more complex to detect and noise and glare. So naturally, with using a camera, detecting squares in a robust manner was essential for us. So, how do we detect squares? Well, first of all, we use CV2's in-range function, which highlights any portions that we specify. So, in this case, we have our threshold at uh, green, and all the green areas will be highlighted, as you can see with this square right here. Then, we use CV2's find contours around the green areas, and this basically just draws contours around any green areas. We only take into consideration contours that are above a certain fixed pixel threshold, such as if there's little green spotches detected in the corner, it'll ignore them. If we find more than five squares that are above the pixel threshold, we take the biggest four contours detected. So now that we have the squares and we know how many squares we have, we need to gather data on the squares to solve the green square cases. To do this, we use CV2's minimum and closing circle, which draws a circle, which draws the minimum sized circle around a certain contour. Over here, this can be demonstrated by this white line over here. So with the minimum and closing circle, we can find out the length of the square as it is the diameter of the circle. And we can also find 
the coordinates of the square on the frame as the circle's midpoint. Also note that the diameter of the circle is a little bit bigger than the square. And I'll explain how we handle that a little bit later on. So now I'm going to talk about slicing. So slicing is like taking the data that you need and leaving the rest of the data values out. In this case, it would be taking only the parts of the frame that we need. So for example, if this was the original frame and this red box was the part of the data that we needed, the sliced image would be the data that we need and then we can do certain things like draw contours or analyze that part. So next we have to find out solutions. Our, our first solution was to slice along the lines so that each, each quadrant would have a separate square. So over here, you can see that if we slice along these lines, each of the quadrants will either have a square or not have a square. Then we can take the bottom two into consideration, and based on that, we know which way to turn. But this ended up being very hard to implement, as if there were diagonal cases, we would have to have diagonal slices. And also, it was very inefficient, as there was line detection needed as well. So we found our second solution, which was to check around squares. Basically, the way this worked was we would locate the position of the squares in relation to the intersection by looking at the little points around it. So basically, the way we would take little points around it would be by taking a 50 by 50 pixel area around the squares. And this can be demonstrated as the little red boxes around the green squares. Let's take square three, for example. If we check a 50 by 50 pixel area onto the right of it, and we see a line, we know that it's on the right of the line. Then if we take a 50 by 50 pixel area above it, like here, and we see a line, we know that it's below the line. So if it's also to the left and below, we know that it is in the bottom right. But this was not robust as if the angle was slanted, sometimes the, the little slices, the 50 by 50 pixel slices would not land exactly on the line and it was time consuming and overheated. This was the way that we determined the slices. Uh, this, this algorithm over here is the way that we determine the slices. So first of all, we take the center X from the minimum and closing circle, and then we add 0 0.9 times the diameter. The reason we only take 0 0.9 times the diameter is because as I showed you earlier, the circle was a little bit bigger than the square that was in it. So we use that to eliminate this gap. So once we take that point, that will be somewhere over here on this edge. Then we add fifth, then this operator basically says to go until this point, which is the plus 50. So that'll be our X coordinate of plus 50. Then for the Y values, we just take the center Y and we go minus 25 and positive 25, giving us our 50 by 50 pixel area. But as I mentioned earlier, this was inefficient as we needed up to 12 slices for three squares. So we came to our final solution, which was to use relative positioning. Basically, the way that this would work was it would compare the locations of the squares to each other to determine where they were on the line. For example, in this case over here on the right, you can see that there are three squares. In a three square case, there are always two squares on the same row. And in this case, it would be the top two. These squares can either be at the top two or the bottom two. Now, by comparing the, the top two squares by each other, we can find out which two are in the same row. If those two are on the top row, we know we either have to turn left or right. But if they are in the bottom two, such as a case like this, we know that we have to go backward because there's two bottom squares. The way that we determine where the last square is, this square over here, is we compare it, we compare its distance between this square and this square, and we see if it's far away or not. For example, in, for example, if there's two squares next to each other, we can check if they're on the same row using this algorithm right here. This basically says that if the difference of their X coordinates, if the absolute value of the difference of the X coordinates is greater than uh, zero, three fourths of their size, the average of their sizes, then they're on different levels. So for example, this would be, if this was 100 and this was 100, and we'll assume that they all have a size of 50, including the line, this would equate to 100 and 
the diameter will equate to 50 plus 50 and average is 50 and zero points multiply that by 0 0.75 and this would hold true because they're on different levels but if they were on the same level uh, like this the the absolute value would be very small and it would not be greater than their sizes this ended up working for all angles and it was extremely efficient but in some cases such as a one square case we cannot determine whether where the, where it is in relation to the line based on comparing it to other squares because there are none so in this case we incorporate a piece of solution two and we check around the squares as well to find out if there's a line or not this ended up working very well as we only needed a maximum of two slices in any case and it was efficient and was robust and worked from all angles uh, this is the entire flowchart of how it works and i'll just uh, go through it briefly so in the three square case we determine which two are on the same level and if the odd square out is above the other two, we have to go back. So that would be if two squares were on top and one square was on the bottom. If the one is on the bottom, we just check if the single square is closer to the left square or to the right square. And then we know whether to turn left or right. In a two square case, however, such as this one right here, we know that they're in diagonals so we can know which way to turn left or right. But if they're on the same level over here, we have to check a slice to the left of it. And with that, we know whether to go left or go right. Finally, in a one square case, we just check two slices next to it and decide where to go based on those slices values. We did, however, make some improvements to our final solution. For example, originally in the equations I showed you before, the amount of pixels apart the squares had to be to be considered on different levels was a fixed amount, but then we changed it to be based on the, on the size of the squares. Also, the position of the slices next to the green squares was also a fixed amount, but that was also changed to be based on the sizes of the squares to make our system much more robust. Uh, here's a small video explaining uh, of a robot doing it. And as you can see, since that square was in the top section, the robot just continued forward. Now we're going to be talking about obstacle avoidance. So the task and solution, what is obstacle avoidance? So when line following, there will be an obstacle, whether it be a water bottle or some sort of obstruction placed in the middle of the line. The goal is to go around that obstacle and then make it back onto the line to continue line following. We did this. We were able to successfully complete this through a series of serial communications between the Raspberry Pi and the Mega Pi. So here's two flowcharts of the algorithm on the Mega Pi and the Raspberry Pi. We're going to start by taking a look at the Mega Pi algorithm because it can read sensor values from the ultrasonic sensor. This sensor sensor is what we use to determine if there's an obstacle in front or not. So if there is an obstacle and if the ultrasonic uh, sees it with, uh, if it's seen by the ultrasonic sensor, it will send this message, the letter O, to the Pi, the Raspberry Pi. Now, once the Pi receives this message right here, it knows that it's time to do obstacle and it will stop line following. So back to the Mega Pi algorithm, once it sends the letter O, it will turn and that is how it prepares to go about doing obstacle. It has to turn and then starts to curve around the obstacle. So now once it has finished turning, it sends a letter D to the Raspberry Pi. Once it, the Raspberry Pi has received the letter D, it knows it is fine. It, it knows that it can start looking for the line. So now since the obstacle is blocking the line, you have to turn around it. And then once you see the line again, you have to get back onto the line. That's why, we, uh, that's why we were able to use the camera to detect the line. So once the line has been detected, the Raspberry Pi will send the letter B over to the Mega Pi, and that signifies the obstacle is done and line following can continue as normal.
So here's a video of obstacle in action. So the robot is line following, and then when it sees the obstacle, it will send over the letter O. Now it turns and it gets ready to go around the obstacle. This is when it sends the letter D. Now it's going around the obstacle. It sees the line again. This is when it sends the letter B to tell the Mega Pi. This is when the Raspberry Pi sends the letter B to tell the Mega Pi that it can go back to line following. And then it goes back to line following. So here's obstacle again, but with a wall on one side instead. The algorithm is pretty similar. It sends a letter O when it sees the obstacle. But this time, when it turns, instead of sending the letter D now, it will turn in the opposite direction, and then it will send the letter D then. So it sends it right here. And then it goes around the obstacle, sends a letter B, and returns the line following. So the reason why we used all these letters to send back and forth was because originally when we were testing, let's say the robot was right here and it saw the obstacle, it would be the camera would be looking at this area of the line, which was not good because we wanted to uh, trace around the obstacle until it saw the line. So it would be seeing the line too early. That's why once the robot turned and it was facing in this case, this direction, the camera would be seeing this blank area. And that's that would be a good sign because then once it sees this line, this area line, then it would know it can go back to line following. So that's why we sent multiple signals with serial. Okay. Now I'm gonna be talking about the second phase or room of the challenge. First, the layout. To give a brief explanation of this phase, first we enter the room here. Then we locate the victims, which are represented by black and silver balls. And then we, tr we travel to and store the victims within our mechanism. Then we locate the black triangle or evacuation zone, which is located in one of the two corners. And then we travel to and drop the victims off at the zone. Okay, this is a high level representation of the processes in the evac room. First, we enter. The silver tape signals the start of the evac room. Then, we locate. Using the most robust method possible, we locate the victims or balls and prioritize which to help or grab first. Then we collect. We develop the mechanism which grabs and stores victims and which is within the necessary size parameters for the competition. Then we evacuate the victims. We have to bring the victims to safety. We find the evacuation zone and then we travel to and drop the victims off at the zone. Now we'll dive a little bit deeper on certain aspects of our method to solve the evac room. First up, locating the victims. This is the procedure we use for locating the victims. By narrowing the field of vision, our overall image processing capabilities are faster. By prioritizing, we eliminate the risk of having to travel backwards once we find a victim. By correcting the angle of which our robot is facing the victim, we can prevent accidents such as hitting the ball when turning and having to back up before grabbing the victims. And finally, by utilizing a few precise calculations beforehand, we can save a lot of time overall and prevent minor errors, such as lighting, to affect the camera's perception. Since this is one of the deeper aspects of the evac room, we'll dig a little bit deeper into these steps. Okay. A few more basic operations are done to the frame, beyond, done to the image beyond narrowing the field of vision, such as grayscaling, which applies a filter to, uh, to reduce noise, and blurring, which is additional help to reduce noise. The next part of our procedure is prioritizing. To be clear, by prioritizing, I mean locating the ball closest will allow us to travel the board with ease instead of having to reach up the locations we've already been through. This is done by analyzing the victim's radius compared to the victims next to them. The closer the victim, the greater the radius and vice versa. In order to allow some gray area for the camera to look for, we utilize the min and max radius of the function cv 2hue circles. If you look at the images on the left, the first GIF up there shows that the balls are both the same size and can be detected when right next to each other. The GIF down uh, underneath it shows that when one ball is ahead of another, it can detect which ball is ahead based on its radius. Like I mentioned before, the closer the ball, the greater the radius. Okay. Moving on to adjusting. 
In order to maintain a robust method for solving the evac room, we produced a plan to accurately position the robot for initiating the retrieval phase. The, gray, the two images above demonstrate the camera's perspective. The gray area is the optimal location for the ball to be located. The gray area is, I'm, I'm talking about this thing. One second, right here. Uh, in order to line up our robot, we analyze the location of the ball in comparison to the gray area, which is done all in the pie, and then send the correction parameters required to the MegaPi or Arduino. The final part of our procedure is calculations. We calculate the exact distance needed to be traveled to arrive at the ball, but leave enough room for the mechanism to pick up the ball. We use a method called triangle similarity. To explain this at a high level, it uses information that is unique to every camera to produce a focal length, which is then used to calculate distance. This line right here is what grabs the values x, y, and r uh, from the function cv2.hu circles, like I mentioned before. x stands for the x coordinate of the center of the victim y for the y coordinate of the center of the victim, and r for the radius of the victim. This is the work that's done beforehand, which is the formula for calculating the focal length, which, as I said before, it was unique to every camera. And this is, the, uh, this is a function that's run live to determine exactly how far the victim is. And this is just for debugging purposes, we print the distance and the center. The final big aspect of the evac room is collecting all the victims. First, we utilize the calculations. This relies heavily on the communication between the Raspberry Pi and the MegaPi. And the next step, storage, relies heavily on the hardware side. The first part of our procedure for this, like I mentioned on the previous slide, is, information, is where information regarding the angle adjustments necessary are sent to the MegaPi, followed by the distance of the victim from the robot, which then the MegaPi has the motors act accordingly. Just to make sure, just to clarify, this is the Raspberry Pi, again, and this is the Mega Pi. The final part of our procedure for collecting the victims is storage. This short clip is a demonstration of the robot grabbing and dropping the victims. Although in the actual competition, we'll hold on to the victims longer until we get to the evac zone. As you can see in the video, the texture from the front of the mechanism doesn't allow the ball to roll away when grabbing it, and the storage allows the robot to hold more than one victim at a time. The last step, which utilizes a little bit of every of a few previous steps, is bringing the victims to, to, to the evac zone. This step utilizes multiple functions to detect a black rectangle, apply respective adjustments, calculate the distance, and finally drop the victims off at the evac zone. The black rectangle is refers to one side of the evac zone, which is here. Applying the res respective adjustments, I mentioned in the previous slide when we're looking for victims, the same process is used here as well and calculating the distance is once again triangle similarity. Anyway, thank you for listening to our presentation and now we will be taking questions. Awesome work guys. Thanks. <laughs> uh, someone was asking how does the robot know how large the obstacle is? Oh yeah, so it's there's we don't um have like a specified um like specified um what's it called size of for the obstacle. It's more of a like um it's more of a like this is how big it can be and we're just gonna go like a little bit more around that. So well, besides that, you guys are basically just uh, just to detect the obstacle and then you keep turning probably to a certain angle until you see the white area anyway, right? So perhaps in the future, you just need to keep moving until you don't see an obstacle, perhaps. But just oh, for information or details, out. use the obstacle okay. size they do at do the that? game. At the game, it does give you a maximum size. They will, they will tell you that the maximum is in such a diameter. And besides, more importantly, just as importantly, is the obstacle between the obstacle and the other lines is at least a minimum 10 cm apart. So those are the minimum requirements. Any questions? Um, you want 30 more seconds. Um, Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question.
Um, when we when when you were deciding whether to use a camera or a light sensor, like line following with the color sensor or light sensor, um, there were more cons than pros. So why, in the end, why did you choose to choose? The I said there. Are you guys able to hear me right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I said there were pros and cons. Although um, a camera is has a bit more difficulty in terms of coding, it's much more useful in the future. As first of all, you're able to have a wider field of view, unlike the light array and color sensor, which only have like a tiny view where it can only see like right below it. And along with that, the light array and color sensor also have to be put at a fixed position from the line and a fixed angle. So it really limits what kind of flexibility you have. Although in terms of like software and hardware, a camera may be harder to implement, it is well worth it in the end. Um, yeah, I just want to add something. We only kind of, uh, you know, touch the surface, um, but uh, eventually, hopefully, we'll get into things like machine learning and, uh, you know, even AI, I guess, like neural networks in order to do this competition. Um, unfortunately, the hardware isn't exactly powerful enough yet, so we did as much as we could um, with what we had. Um, but once you get past the initial um, step of, you know, getting used to using the camera and learning Python and stuff, like Andy said, it's well worth it. There's so many options with the camera. So basically, um, the camera has, when comparing a light sensor and a camera, the light sensor has more cons, and that's why, and for the camera, the pros outweighed the cons. There's fewer, but they outweighed them, yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank I you. Think, yeah, I think you can keep it short. It means that it gives you a much more robust result, a more versatile, and at the same time, is a much more robust. Right. right. Um, we have another question. Uh, let's see. How were you guys able to get half circles to work accurately? I could probably answer that. Uh, I don't exactly know what you mean by working accurately, but if I'm guessing that you mean by it's not able to detect it consistently, the reason why it's not is because we're obviously displaying the image on the screen, so it's going to be a little bit of a lag time. But on the actual, what's on the internal process of the camera, it's working pretty fast. I think that's what you're asking, but like if you could clarify, that'd be a little bit nicer. Yeah, Brian, go ahead to unmute yourself if you want to further elaborate your questions. I meant like, because like when we tried it, it just like gave like a whole bunch of circles. Like we couldn't figure out how to like fine tune the values to actually give usable oh. results. What we used was the, there's two parameters for the hue circles, which is min and max radius. It, the moment you start like working with those, it's a bit of a trial and error process. But once you figure out the values that actually are, uh, uh, that are suitable for like the range that you're looking for, that's when you like you actually get the values that you want. And when we're using contours and everything to like uh, make the hue circles more accurate, we set like the we asked it to like display the, only the largest contour in the image. So that would mean like the uh, the closer the it would eliminate all those little circles that you pop up because of light and everything in the background. I hope um, I answered your question. The other thing is too, Surgeon. You um, something that I think helped was you decided not to use static parameters for the hue circles function. Um, yeah. Can you try, you know, like different ranges of values for the min and max radius? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you kept static values uh, uh, based on the environment, like what the image is actually showing, you could end up getting junk circles or not finding anything at all. Um, but for, you know, an individual frame, um, if you try multiple different parameters, uh, you can start to find circles accurately, like a bunch of different distances separately. Brian, yep. you have any more questions regarding that topic? Uh, this, that sounds like this is a definitely, it's a very interesting topic that you guys can further elaborate on it. Uh, we have just started a new forum for easy communication. We'll talk about that in a bit as well, but then let's go to the next questions though. And next questions is from, uh, Alexander, why did you use Arduino to control the motors instead of using the motor driver? Right. Uh, I can answer uh, that. Yeah, go oh, ahead. Yeah. So um, it's, although it's true that you can use a motor driver with the Pi, uh, we also had to include like sensors, like the ultrasonic sensor and IMU. And the um, Arduino allowed us to 
like with one board use the sensors and control motors at the same time so that's why we did that also we have two big motors and three servo motors and also two additional uh two additional sensors including the the pi camera so we just didn't think that raspberry pi would be able to handle all of that mm -hmm. okay um Alexander, you okay? You you have any other questions regarding that? No. No. Okay. The next one. That one's easy one. Can you use C plus plus for the Open CV? Yes, you can. But we yes. just have to use Python because um, C plus plus, although it does have functions for um, for um, Open CV, it, they're a bit more complicated. While um, Python is uh, overall much neater. However, C plus plus is mainly used for they have like larger functions, which have like greater parameters and that stuff, but that's better for like restricting, um, how do I put this, like making it quicker and more robust, but Python is more easier for um, beginners. Also in Python, there's the NumPy library. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. OpenCV, like Andy mentioned before, OpenCV, when you do a video, uh, video capture object it's called, and you, and you read in a video from the camera, uh, it gives you one image at a time, and each one of those images is actually a NumPy array. <clears throat> so you can use the entire NumPy library on the frames, as well as the OpenCV library, which is very, very helpful. Right. Okay, next question. Uh, in the grabbing system that you used, is, isn't it possible for the ball to fall out of the storage through the front? How uh, do you account for that? Uh, wait, Andy, can you open that slide? Uh, basically, the way that that works is uh, there's a little blue flap, and once the balls go onto the blue flap, it closes up. And basically, once it closes up, it stores them, and it also blocks any of the other ones from coming back. Uh, we actually encountered problems with it hitting the camera, which is why also one reason we decided to use a rotating camera, so that it could move out of the way so that balls could be stored. Wait, maybe um, when you guys lower the front door, though, to pick up a second ball, would the first one possibly fall out? Uh, no, because we have a pie camera blocking, and only before it goes up do we move it up. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Are you pulling up the video again, Andy? Yeah, I think I was kicked out for a sec, so... <laughs> It's kind of laggy. Can you pause this or is this a GIF? This is a GIF. Oh, bummer. You can just annotate it and it'll pause. Though. Oh yeah, if I annotate it, it'll, yeah. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, I gotta time this. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so basically the Pi camera moves out of the way right before it stores the balls so that nothing can go in. That's I don't think it's rotating this video, but yeah, right before it brings it down, the Pi camera will rotate, which won't allow any other balls to come in. Very neat. Right. So you have a tiny servo on the side. I didn't yeah. know the area. Yeah. I think you guys mentioned this yesterday. I don't mentioned it before, but um, I think the Pi camera is actually facing straight down now. Right? Yeah, right now. Also use that position to locate the ball better in order to pick it up easier. Which is, which is handy. Okay, well, um, so we are two minutes, just a tad over time, but that's okay. Uh, anyone has any questions? We'll give you another 30 seconds. Right. As I can see most of you, except a couple of them, I don't recognize the names, I know all of you. Um, now we're going to have, uh, well, we always have anyway, but then that forum was not very like modernish, okay. But then we're going to have a new form that which actually is well, do, does allow single login. So as long as you have a Google account and you can log in as well, so you don't have to have separate login. So we're going to highly encourage today, especially for kids like you guys that who get into a more in depth uh, into robotics, uh, even just programming, as a matter of fact, and then do engage in the forum and discuss. So let's say, for example, Brian has that question. So if he just want to get a better understanding as to how to get that done accurately, we do more than welcome get on the forum and then people will discuss and then hopefully help you find a solution. Okay, so that will be a more long term. Oh, I have another question. 
how would you get the robot to stop right next to the evacuation area since the camera is right in the front, not on the side? I'm sorry, do you want to that? Yes. How would you get the robot to stop right next to the evacuation area? I guess he meant the triangle. Okay, uh, that's so what I was mentioning on like, the bottom slide. We use triangle similarity to calculate the exact distance. And uh, since we're sending information to the Megapi, we can use the IMU to actually, or the Arduino and the IMU to exactly travel uh, right in front of the um, evacuation zone. Is that clear enough or is there anything else? Yeah, so I just want to clarify a little bit. Um, the triangle similarity, uh, what is it, Surgeon? The triangle similarity what? Uh, formula, I guess it's a formula, formula, yeah. Yeah, it's like an equation. Um, it's, it's pretty much just for converting from like pixels to centimeters. Um, so you have to do a little bit of setup on, on an obstacle. Um, you have to have like a known distance and a known size obstacle. Um, and then from there, you can make a formula that allows you to convert the pixels to centimeters. So if the robot is you know, on the other side of the evac zone over here, um, and it can rotate until it's facing straight at the, the evac zone, it locates the, uh, the big rectangle. Um, and then uh, using the triangle similarity formula, you can take the, the, pixel, the pixel length and find out how many centimeters that is and then you can find out the distance in centimeters as well um mm -hmm. and with that information they can use the or they used uh the imu to drive the exact distance and then turn so they're right there if you're interested though uh we could scroll a, a few slides before this and we can give like an actual code representation of what jeremy was explaining right there where i actually took the values from the function yeah right here um let me annotate Okay. Um, this was what Jeremy was talking about when he said that you needed a few known values, the pixel radius object. This is when uh, I actually took the functions that were, um, that were being given from the hue circles thing, uh, hue circles form, uh, function, which gave us the radius. And then I was able to calculate the diameter out of, uh, from the radius by just multiplying by two, obviously. And that's how I actually, that's how we got like the, one of the values for, uh, beforehand that we needed. And these are the measurements that were done like uh, by like a measuring tape and everything beforehand again, which Jeremy mentioned. Right. Yeah, so all the balls are the same size as well. Um, oh yeah, and I probably should have, sorry, I'm probably should have mentioned this before. The units and the distance that it actually measures it is like in live is inches. It converts that from like uh, the pixels on the screen to inches. You used inches? Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of bad. I, I like realized afterwards that I should have wanted centimeters. Okay. Well, next question is how many hours did you guys put in per week? Uh, uh, as their mentor, I can say probably about thirty solid hours. I mean, thirty minutes a week, probably. Thirty. What? <laughs> no group <grouping> around. <laughs> no. Um, so I what do you say? Uh, hey, um, yeah. What do you think, guys? So let's see, yeah. Closer, closer to the competition, uh, hours started becoming more because we started coming in at night. So maybe like eight, I don't. Yeah, I would say, but yeah, I would say eight hours that when I saw your face here, but you do, you, you did your work at home too, right? Yeah. 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 Right, now, uh, just, just to be realistic here, so to do this type of work, uh, good work, um, as it approached to the competition in the last three months, probably it's going to get progressively more hours. But as always, everybody's like, <laughs> the last two months, probably every week is going to be 16 hours a week, right? But then before that, minimal four, like say September, or would you say like four, six, eight hours a week, four hours a week minimal? Yeah, I would say yeah. about that. Yeah, probably. Right. Definitely. That was September. Right, that was like a nine, almost like what seven months before the competition. That was like that time. You're already four hours a week, so as just take 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 think about it, it's gonna progressively get more. So at the last month, it was eight to sixteen hours a week. It's very common. Yeah, even back then too, they were working extra during the week and uh, coming into the center so they could you know do more um, practice and testing and stuff. Right. That was all the way back in like November, I think they started coming in extra. Yeah, yeah, 